any president is going to be confronted with this kind of backlash, why is it always us? Why do we have to go up and clean up this stuff? Why can't the Europeans do that? Why can't others take care of this? Why can't the Chinese take care of North Korea? So these are the things that I think is a fundamental debate that's going on. We have Jackson Jains here with us today, uh, from the, the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies and one of the leading experts in transatlantic relations. Thanks for coming to Göttingen. Great pleasure. Um, as someone who's very familiar with politics on both sides of the Atlantic, um, do you think that Donald Trump's rise now is that indicative of some kind of convergence of styles of politics? Does he remind you of right-wing populist leaders in Europe? I think he reminds me most of all of them Berlusconi. I think that there is a personalization of politics that's been going on for a while in the United States in particular. But you see it happening now in Europe and Berlusconi was the poster child for that for a long time. I think that uh, there is a larger, shall we say, trend or, or uh, groundswell that's supporting it, which I don't think was the case 10, 15 years ago. And that I think is new and we do share that. Whether it's the AFD Germany, whether it's Le Pen in Paris, whether it's even the Brexit uh, people are, are not comparison completely. But if you go on to Austria, if you go on to various different directions, you'll see a kind of a groundswell of people saying, I'm angry, I feel left behind, I want better representation, I don't trust the party system. That is something we share on both sides of the Atlantic. But let's come to foreign policy, your, yeah. your special field of expertise. Um, I mean, what's the impact of foreign policy on this election? Will it matter at all? And if so, uh, in what way? Well, not in a sophisticated way. In other words, we're not talking about how do we handle the Iranian nuclear agreement or where do we find a way to get the peace settlement in uh, Syria. It's more the debate in the United States in particular with regard to what is it that we need to do abroad and what is it that we don't? What is the definition of leadership and what is the definition of protecting national interests? This is a debate that is as old as the country, but it's now been sort of, sort of uh, uh, metastasized into a debate about a general theme in the U.S. right now, which is what are we responsible for? Are we supposed to be the world policeman or not? And this argument is not a new one, but it's something that is now very much a part of the domestic debate. So to answer your question, foreign policy normally doesn't really impact foreign uh, presidential races too much. But this time around, it's so mixed in with the domestic policy debates that it's hard to differentiate the two. Both are going to have a, a, certain, a certain impact. But isn't that a very sophisticated debate in a certain way? Because you said it will not be sophisticated because this you know, concerns very general directions it is, it, is in, it is in that recent, in that sense, it is a debate that's been around the, 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 the country for a long time. You remember, for example, after World War II, there was a trend toward, let's pull back, we, did the war, we finished the war, now we can devote ourselves to the United States. And then you have this wave of going back and forth between how much we reach out. We had it in a, in a factor of 10 after 9-11. This is up and down. This is a wave that goes through the United States all the time. What I'm saying is not sophisticated is the way it's being framed by the two candidates at the moment. And that I find to be very, very worrisome because if it's about are we going to be strong, are we going to be weak, are we going to be a leader, are we going to be not, that's a false equation and that's what I mean is not sophisticated. So let's talk about uh, the two sides a little. Um, is there something like a Trump doctrine? I mean, according to what you just said, probably not, but is there something like a more or less coherent policy position you could you could see behind all the provocation, you know, all the forth and back that he presents. I think there's a fundamental question, as I said before, that doesn't necessarily come across as new, and that is, you know, what is it the responsibility of the United States to deal with uh, crises around the world where fires are burning out of control? By the way, another sophisticated question is what can we suspect can be the uh, requirements and burden sharing of our allies, including Germany, by the way. Those are sophisticated questions, but they haven't been framed by Mr. Trump in a very sophisticated way. I think that, uh, that, that uh, Senator Clinton, uh, Secretary Clinton, 
has done that by virtue of the fact that she spent four years in the State Department. So there's more of a, of a, of a framework to understand what she wants record. to do. For the record, she's got a record and she's got a, a way of talking about it. Trump doesn't. And so I think that he's appealing to more of an emotional feeling about foreign policy's challenges, even though they're not new ones. So, but as general it stands that America should be less involved in world affairs, which I think could be his position so far, at least interpretation of it. it Isn't it something be. that could, you know, possibly enjoy broad support, not even among Republican voters, but especially among independents or Democrats? Yeah, I, it will because of the fact that the last 15 years have exhausted a good portion of the American public. Many of them have lost loved ones in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and probably elsewhere. There is an exhaustion factor about how much we should be intervening in wars that we cannot win or that we are certainly not designed to uh, have a strategy to win. And even Obama, you know, responded to that by the, making the decision about not uh, following up in Syria after the use of poison gas. So any president is going to be confronted with this kind of backlash. Why is it always us? Why do we have to go up and clean up this stuff? Why can't the Europeans do that? Why can't others take care of this? Why can't the Chinese take care of North Korea? So these are the things that I think is a fundamental debate that's going on. Do you see substantial differences between Obama and Clinton? I think that Clinton's attitude toward dealing with, shall we say, uh, um, a confrontation or a conflict with Russia uh, may be tougher than Obama's has been. I think that maybe we might see a more aggressive foreign policy when it comes to looking at issues like Syria. But I do not think that there will be a difference in terms of her se sending troops in there to deal with it. I don't think that will change much either, largely because the domestic support isn't there. But I think if, if she was to become president, I think you would see more of a continuity with Obama than you would with Donald P. Trump. <laughs> Sure. Um, maybe a last question. So, uh, is Germany still important? I mean, I know we always say this. You know, every every politician would say, you know, the transatlantic partnership is important. Um, but do foreign policy elites really still care what's happening in Germany and how we lead? And also, like the perception of the the population in general, it seems to me like you know, China or Asia, the Middle East, that's all featured strongly, you know, in American television. Um, but Germany. It's not really uh, an important issue to many Americans, or Europe in general. Are we still important in that regard? I think that is dependent on the issue. Um, it seems to me that Europe is as important as Germany, and Germany is as important as Europe. <laughs> in the sense that we share a good deal of interests in dealing with a coherent European Union, a capable and as you would say in German, handlungsfähig, capability factor of Europe, dealing with other crises that maybe we are not necessarily going to deal with directly. Let's take Ukraine as an example. I think that there is an enormous amount of importance with the use of European-U.S. relations in shaping the world economic structures that we have had over the last decades, which we've built together. So the relevancy factor is very much there. I think the real question is not that there's a zero-sum game, not that we're going to pivot to Asia and forget about Europe. That was a false formulation. We're going to do both. But we realize that Europe ain't going to help us with North Korea very much, that Europe has a terrific uh, amount of engagement, in Germany in particular, in China, but you're not patrolling the South China Sea. We are. So we're going to have to figure out a new burden-sharing equation in the 21st century, but we need to share it, and we need to share it with Europe. That was a great last line. Thanks for talking to us. Pleasure.